dear Mr. Secretary General, dear viewers, a warm welcome to this special edition of our interview series in cooperation with Der Spiegel, which is called The New World Disorder. And rarely has a title been more adequate than it is today. We have 100,000 Russian troops standing near the Ukrainian border. We have a flurry of diplomatic activity so far with very little tangible results. And after the meeting today with uh, Chancellor Scholz, our guest speaker, NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg, reiterated that there is a real risk of military confrontation on European soil. This is a very worrying outlook, and it's a crucial moment for European security. So we are very privileged and honored to have the NATO Secretary General, Jens Stoltenberg, with us today. A warm welcome, Mr. Secretary General. Great to have you. And we will talk, obviously, about scenarios, but also options on the table in the current crisis. At this point, let me also extend a warm welcome to the NATO delegation here in Berlin. Of course, everyone heeding the very rigid um, corona protocol. And let me also say a warm thank you to the delegation for making this conversation happen today. I'm also extremely delighted to have with me our friend and colleague Britta Sandberg, the foreign correspondent of Der Spiegel based in Paris and the co-host for this series of discussions. Now, before we kick this off, dear viewers, um, let me remind all of us, and especially you, that you can post questions to the Secretary General during those 45 minutes. Um, to do so, please go to slido.com and enter the following code, 648034, and the code also appears on the screen. So without ado, Britta, the floor is yours. Mr. Secretary General, you said yourself last week there is a real risk for a new armed conflict in Europe. On Friday, there was more confirmation of Russian forces being moved towards Ukraine from other parts of the country. The Atlantic Council's Digital Forensic Research Lab analyzed pictures post on TikTok, posted on TikTok and other social media this month, which it said showed mobile short-range missiles and T-72 tanks being transported westwards. My first question is a very simple but also a very terrifying one. How close are we these days to a war situation in Ukraine? There is a real danger, uh, because it is exactly as you say, uh, there is a continued military build-up with tens of thousands of combat-ready troops, uh, with heavy equipment, uh, with uh, battle tanks, with uh, armored vehicles and a lot of other uh, offensive weapon systems. This is combined with um, a very threatening rhetoric, where Russia says that uh, uh, we have some proposals, and if you don't accept them, there will be consequences. And they speak about what they refer to as uh, military technical consequences. And then on top of that, we have a track record uh, of Russia um, using military force against Ukraine before. So uh, capabilities, threatening rhetoric, and a track record, of course, that is something we have to take very seriously, and that's exactly what we do. Uh, but at the same time, we need to strive for dialogue. And that's what we have done today in NATO. We have, uh, I invited again mm -hmm. uh, all the members of the NATO Russia Council, the 30 allies, and uh, Russia to sit down and try to find a, a political path forward. But enough reasons to be nervous. Should we be nervous? Are you more nervous than ever before, if you remember your time as a Secretary General these last years? I will use the phrase concerned, and we are deeply concerned um, because uh, uh, it is a, um, yeah, a serious situation in and around Ukraine. And, um, but at the same time, we should never give up the efforts to try to find a political uh, way forward. And we should also do what we can to deter or dissuade uh, Russia from once again using force against the neighbor. And therefore, we are also sending a message to Russia that there will be a high price to pay. There will be economic financial sanctions. 
uh, we provide NATO allies provide support to Ukraine so they can defend themselves. And also that is uh, increasing the threshold for any use of force against uh, Ukraine. And thirdly, of course, we are always ready to protect and defend all allies if, uh, if there is any threat against any NATO allies. So, so we are working hard and hoping for the best, but preparing for the worst time we do the two things in parallel. Mm. The United States, as other Western allies, watch with growing irritation, as I understood it, that inside the German government attitudes how to deal with Russia are quite different, if not contradictory. The Green Party is demanding a more harsher tone towards Moscow and the SPD a more accommodating position vis-a-vis -vis Russia. Don't we need, in this special situation, this crisis situation, a very clear announcement of strict and hard sanctions to counter Moscow's threats? We need unity, but at the same time, I think we have to just be honest and say we are an alliance of 30 allies, uh, 30 democracies, with a lot of different parties and uh, uh, different history, different geography from both sides of the Atlantic. So, of course, there are different views and, 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 and we see changes in governments. Uh, so, so we will always, uh, if we look for it, we will always find differences uh, uh, among and between NATO allies. And for me, that's not a strength. It's a kind of, it's not a weakness, it's actually a strength that, that, that we have all these different views. As long as we're able to agree around the core responsibility, and that is to protect each other and also provide support to Ukraine. And, and, and we have uh, agreed around that core task. Uh, so for instance, we had a statement just before Christmas from all 30 allies about imposing a heavy price, uh, imposing sanctions on Russia if they use force against Ukraine again. Supporting Ukraine, but also making sure that we are ready to protect and defend all allies. So on the core task, we agree, but then, of course, there are different views and assessment among 30 allies. You met um, the Chancellor, <coughs> Olaf Scholz, today. Um, have you got the impression that he is moving towards um, perhaps a harsher tone or more decided strategy to... Well, I, I think that Chancellor Scholz should uh, speak behalf of, on, on behalf of himself and we had a joint uh, press conference mm -hmm. and I think he conveyed a very clear message there that of course we don't uh, 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 respect uh, or we don't uh, accept any use of force against, uh, against uh, a sovereign independent country, uh, Ukraine. And, and, and actually uh, Germany both uh, has helped NATO to provide support to Ukraine, Germany has imposed heavy sanctions uh, broadly supported uh, from the political parties in, uh, in Germany, also when Scholz was uh, vice chancellor and, and finance minister on uh, Russia after legal annexation of Crimea in 2014. And Germany has been part of the military buildup of NATO in the eastern part of the alliance. Uh, Germany is leading the battle group in, in Lithuania. So Germany also, uh, with, uh, Chance, with uh, then previously uh, uh, finance minister Sean, uh, Scholz and now also mm -hmm. Chancellor Scholz, I'm absolutely certain Germany will be uh, supportive of the NATO approach to, uh, to Russia uh, uh, when it comes to Ukraine. But up to now, Ger Germany is not saying that, for example, the use of or Nord Stream 2 would be part of possible sanctions. And, for example, the chairman of the Munich, uh, Munich Security Conference, uh, Wolfgang Ischinger, said um, some, some weeks ago that Berlin should use um, Nord Stream 2 as a political bargaining chip with Moscow. Uh, are you, have you still kind of comprehension for this German position? Well, on North Stream 2, uh, there are uh, no the agreement. Uh, there's actually disagreement among uh, NATO allies. Some are heavily against uh, the new uh, pipeline. Others are uh, more in favor, at least saying that this is a commercial uh, decision to be taken. Uh, Others, uh, the, the Chancellor it's himself. Yeah, but also, also in Germany, there are mm, different views. Sure. And therefore, NATO has not a unified uh, position. Uh, but what NATO allies agree on is that we need uh, um, a more diverse uh, uh, sources of the supply of energy, including gas. And I think also NATO allies have taken very carefully note of uh, the fact that uh, the, the regulatory authorities in Germany has now suspended the process of, of uh, certifying the new uh, pipeline or opening up the new pipeline. And then I also took very much care, uh, note of the message from the International Energy Agency saying that actually Russia is now manipulating the European gas market, uh, significantly reducing supplies. They could increase significantly supplies of gas to, to Europe, as other gas suppliers have done. Um, and, and they're also depleting or reducing significantly record low levels, the, the, the amount of gas in their storage, uh, storage facilities. So, of course, this, this just demonstrates the 
the, the dangers of being uh, too dependent on one source of supply when it comes to natural gas. You promised um, you will give us some more details about your talks with um, Olaf Scholz. Did you mention um, or did you speak with him about Nord Stream 2, not in the press conference, but in your... Yes, so we, we, we have discussed and, and, and that was a one topic uh, uh, we also uh, uh, discussed. But, but again, my, my NATO's position is that, is that when, when we are not able to agree a common position, then, then on this issue, uh, there is no unified position in NATO. So, so in a way, NATO is extremely strong, very capable, but sometimes we are not able to, uh, to reach consensus. And on the issue of North Stream 2, you can just read the newspapers and you can see that some <laughs> allies are very much against and others uh, defend the pipeline. Okay. <clears throat> so, Mr. Secretary General, even in, in NATO, you sometimes have to agree to, to disagree. But let's move from Berlin to, to Moscow. Um, last week, we've kind of seen a week of, of failed diplomacy, pretty much, with talks aborted in Geneva, in Brussels, in Vienna. And one could kind of get the impression that Moscow never really wanted to find a diplomatic solution to, to, to the current crisis. Um, was this your impression as well? I, I still remember the photo of you being taken with a very stony face with the deputy foreign minister um, Grushka on, on one hand, on the one side, and, and the deputy minister of defense Fomin on the on the other side. So, sh please share with us your impression, and, and do you think that there is any or was ever any flexibility on the Russian side? I think it's too early to judge, uh, too uh, early to, to, to say whether there, there is a possibility to reach uh, some progress, uh, some results uh, uh, in the uh, diplomatic uh, efforts. Um, um, we welcome the fact that uh, Russia uh, and 30 allies were able to sit down uh, for more than two years. NATO has uh, tried to convene a, a meeting on the NATO-Russia Council, and last week we had that meeting. We had four hours of discussions on a wide range of topics, uh, Ukraine and the security situation in Europe. Um, we didn't agree. The, the discussions were difficult, but that's exactly why they were important. Uh, and, and, and that's a good sign that we were together addressing these challenges. Um, uh, then I also welcome the fact that there were bilateral talks uh, the United States Russia. The United States had consulted on every step together with European allies, both before and after those meetings. So allies are also involved in in those uh, bilateral talks, uh, Russia, uh, uh, the United States. And then we had the OC, and then we have also efforts by Germany. I commend Germany for trying to, uh, to reintegrate and, 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 and to strengthen the Normandy uh, format. So there are now many efforts. We don't have any, no, no guarantee, of course, that we will succeed. But the opposite, not to try, is obviously wrong. Uh, so, so I have negotiated with Russia before, when I was Prime Minister of Norway, we agreed on a delimitation line up in the high north in the Barents Sea on energy deals, on, on issues as uh, military lines of communications and also fishery and many other issues. And, and, and I know it's possible to talk to Russia, I know it's possible to make deals with Russia. And that doesn't mean that we will be able to do that this time, but I think we all have to make a serious effort. And NATO is making a serious effort and I have today invited uh, all the members of the NATO-Russia Council um, to participate in a series of meetings addressing uh, different issues. So, so we will continue and then it's for Russia to decide whether they will engage in these talks in good faith, uh, sit down, or whether they just use this as a pretext for once again using force against uh, a neighbor. And if I, if I think, <coughs> may come in, Mr. Secretary General, are you optimistic that this invitation to engage in talks um, in the framework of the NATO-Russia Council, um, will that be seen positively by the, the Russian side? Um, do, will they I think I will see, I'm, I'm, I'm realistic. Also, I, I think it's, uh, it's, 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 it's not clear whether, they will, uh, whether, we will, also, whether we'll be able to make any real progress. But at least from the NATO side, we are really ready to sit down. Uh, and, and, and we know that we have been able to agree with Russia before. For instance, one of the issues we are open to discuss is arms control, uh, uh, missiles, uh, which are one of the concerns, which is one of the concerns that Russia has raised. And, and we are ready. Uh, uh, we had uh, actually a ban on all intermediate range missiles um, uh, with the INF Treaty. Uh, then uh, we saw, the, uh, we saw the, the Russian violations. But if, if, if Russia is willing to sit down and have 
reciprocal balanced uh, uh, arms control agreements on conventional or nuclear weapons, of course, we are in favor of that. Mm. Uh, and then we can discuss in what for, uh, some of the nuclear issues have to be bilateral negotiation in Russia and the United States, but all NATO allies uh, are affected. So, of course, we need uh, NATO allies to be very much involved as NATO allies were involved in the process when the INF Treaty banning all intermediate range weapons w uh, were agreed back in the 1987. Mm. Right, you say, I mean, it's, it's, it's <coughs> possible to, to deal and to do deals with Russia, and it's been possible before. But one of the central questions that people, you know, in, in, in many Western capitals try to kind of wrap their heads around is the question, what actually um, goes on in, in Putin's mind and what is it that he really wants? So it seems to me that he kind of already attained two important goals, namely, first of all, preventing <clears throat> that, at least in the foreseeable future, Ukraine will be able to, to join NATO, that's one. And then also talking to, to US President Biden kind of on an equal footing from kind of global power to global power, if you will. So these are things that he already achieved. And the question is, and the question I, I would be interested in, in hearing your answer to, um, what else does he want? Is it all about turning the clock back on European security? Is it about a Yalta 2.0 moment? As in one way, Russia and also then President Putin have stated very clearly what they want in the two uh, uh, treaties, uh, legally binding treaties they have proposed for the United States and for NATO. And, and, uh, and core articles, provisions in those treaties are clearly violating core principles for European security. It is stated clearly that NATO should have no further enlargement, no new members of NATO. And of course, that violates the whole idea that every nation has the right to choose its own path. And this is not only about Ukraine. This is also about, for instance, the right for Sweden and Finland to join uh, uh, someday if they so uh, decide. And therefore, I think it was very interesting to, to, to listen to the Finnish uh, president who actually used his New Year speech uh, this year to say that Finland is not, not applying for, for membership, but we don't accept. Uh, we will strongly oppose the idea that Russia should sign a deal with NATO, uh, ruling out the possibility for Finland any time in the future to become a NATO member, because this is about Finland's right to choose its own path. The same was the message from the Swedish uh, prime minister. So, so, well, my message on Ukraine is that Ukraine uh, and, and Ukraine's relationship to NATO, that's for Ukraine and 30 allies to decide, no one else. And that applies for all other countries. So, uh, the whole idea that, that in a way big powers can decide what smaller neighbors can do or not do, that is to move us back uh, to Yalta or to, or to uh, an age of spheres of influence. We don't want to go there. Uh, I'm coming from a small country, 5 million people boarding Russia. And of course, when we joined NATO in 1949, the Soviet Union and Joseph Stalin, they were heavily opposed to that. Mm. But at that time, London, Washington, Paris, they said, no, Na Norway has the right to join. And, and they, allow, they allowed us to join. And, and, and this is the principle of, of self-determination that should apply for every nation. And that point is, is well taken. But coming back to kind of um, decision making in, in Moscow, so, so you believe that the decision on what to do with Ukraine has still not been made in, 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 in Moscow? I don't think there is, there is any final, the, as a, there is no certainty at least about what, uh, what the intentions with the, the Russian military buildup uh, is. Uh, we need to prepare, uh, prepare for the worst. We see the buildup, we see the rhetoric, we, see, we, we, need, we know the track record. At the same time, I think it's also important to, to understand that uh, there are many ways for Russia to conduct aggressive actions against Ukraine. It can be a full-fledged invasion with tens of thousands of troops and heavy armor and all that, and missiles and, and, and uh, air attacks. But, but, but we have also seen uh, and know that Russia has uh, the capabilities of doing many other uh, forms of, or conducting many other forms of aggressive uh, uh, actions heavy, very s serious cyber attacks, um, tr uh, efforts to try to uh, cre so create uh, provocations or what we call false flag operations to try to oust the government in Kiev, uh, more smaller military operations to, to create a land bridge from Russia to, to Crimea. There are many possibilities 
uh, which are a bit smaller than the full-fledged invasion, and we and also possibilities that Russia will try to deny any responsibility for, for instance, provocations or 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 uh, um, attempts to interfere in the political processes in, in in Crimea. I say that because we need to be prepared also to react to other scenarios than the full-fledged invasion. Plus, if we go beyond Ukraine, there's I mean there are even more worrying scenarios. Our colleagues from from the Spiegel. Um, have a, a very interesting piece in the current edition saying that even at NATO there are apparently people who are concerned with a much broader attack on a sort of on, on multiple fronts, namely um, sort of Russian forces potentially using their presence in the Mediterranean, in the, in the Northern Atlantic, in the Arctic um, to kind of really strike on a on a broad front, I mean, that's, that's very hard to conceive, but do you think that's a, a is, is that thinkable at all, so or is that Many scenarios? things are thinkable, and, uh, and, uh, and of course we need to be prepared for many scenarios, and there's always a possibility that a tense situation in one place can suddenly move uh, uh, to another place. Mm. Uh, that's absolutely possible. On the, at the same time, I think, if I, and I start, if I now started as Secretary General of NATO to speculate about all those potential scenarios, I would just add to the tensions. So I think now the important thing is to try to reduce tensions, is to call on Russia to de-escalate. Um, Russia is the aggressor. They, have, uh, they are responsible for the military build-up. So I think that instead of speculating about all possibilities, I can just assure all NATO allies that we are prepared. We have plans in place. Uh, we are monitoring. We have intelligence. We are following what's going on in and around Ukraine, but also, of course, uh, along our borders elsewhere. Uh, and, and NATO is always ready to uh, uh, react. And we have lost, since 2014, actually implemented the biggest reinforcement of collective defense since the end of the Cold War, uh, partly with more presence in the eastern part of the alliance, with the BAT groups, before Crimea, before 2014. It was absolutely impossible to envisage a, a, a presence of NATO battle groups in the Baltic countries and Poland. Now we have them. We have air police, we have more naval presence. We have tripled the size of the NATO response force as a result of what Russia did against Ukraine the last time. And of course, we are following uh, what's happening in the high north or in the Mediterranean. So, so we are there, we are uh, uh, vigilant. And, and, and of course, the, the strength of NATO is that we bring North America and Europe together. Together, North America and Europe, we are by far the strongest military power in the world. So as long as we stand united... Uh, Which we're not always do. No, 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 but, uh, but, but on the court has to protect and defend European allies and NATO stand together. Britta. Let us talk about what <clears throat> will happen now in the following days. The Russians are waiting for a written statement with new proposals from the West, but the Russian foreign minister already said <clears throat> that they won't uh, wait indefinitely for a response. He, he said, um, we have run out of patience. Can you give us a kind of timetable? What will happen now in the, this week, next week? So we will soon convey uh, our proposals in written uh, to, uh, to Russia. We have made that clear to them. They know it. Uh, and uh, and uh, those uh, written proposals will uh, reflect our serious readiness to sit down and engage in serious talks about substance on arms control, on, uh, on measures to, uh, to have more transparency on military activities, uh, uh, missiles, many other uh, issues. Uh, but we are not ready to compromise on core principles, the right for us to defend uh, all NATO allies and the right for every nation to choose its own uh, path. And then it will be up to Russia uh, to respond uh, and, uh, and then to hopefully come to the meetings uh, uh, I have invited them to join uh, or to attend. Today, you did uh, it today. Yeah, we, today I, I circled mm. the invitation to all members of the NATO Russia Council, which is the institution we have uh, uh, to make sure that European allies or NATO allies and, uh, and, uh, and Russia meet and, uh, and, and uh, address issues of, of common concern. So, so, of course, we will also listen to the Russian concerns. Uh, that's part of having a dialogue is that we also listen to the other part uh, and, and see what can we do uh, to uh, address them without compromising on core principles for European security. But Russia's quest for security guarantees and NATO's open door policy seem to be irreconcilable positions. So how could a compromise solution look like? What could it be? 
So first of all, these principles are important for all allies. I and mean, we cannot compromise on the principles of every nation's right to choose its own path. Uh, but then I think that if there is going to be any diplomatic progress, any diplomatic solution on any issue, we need to uh, not conduct diplomacy in the public. I mean, there is no way we can reach any agreement on anything uh, if, if we exchange well, all the proposals and all the comments in the media. Uh, I have great respect for discussions like this, but it's not in this uh, as a forum we will actually reach the agreements with Russia. We need to sit down and have uh, talks uh, without uh, publicizing exactly what we are talking about at every moment. You mentioned it already, Russia was planning a false, or is still planning, a false flag operation to justify perhaps an invasion. Apparently Russian special services are preparing provocations against Russian forces. Um, national Security Advisor Jake Sullivan, US National Security Advisor, said last week we saw this playbook in 2014 and they are preparing this playbook again. Um, what kind of intelligence information do you have confirming these activities and attempts? So we, we share in, in, the intelligence among allies. We have uh, seen intelligence also indicating that Russia has uh, not only a military buildup uh, along the borders, but they have also more intelligence operatives inside Ukraine. Uh, and of course, trying to undermine the, the government, the authorities, and, and also the, uh, absolutely possible that they're also planning for different so incidents, accidents, uh, false flag operations that can create- Possible or confirmed? No, so we, we will not go into the details of the intelligence uh, we have, but we have information uh, also confirming uh, what the United States uh, told the world a few days ago, that, that there is a significant um, Russian presence of intelligence officers, op operatives inside Ukraine. We also saw a large-scale cyber attack on Ukrainian government websites. I think uh, several ministries were um, uh, concerned, um, including the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Um, Ukraine's information minister said um, the first data suggests that the attack was carried out by the Russian Federation. <clears throat> what, what can NATO do to avoid further attacks of this scale? Also, NATO and NATO allies provide uh, significant support to Ukraine to help them to strengthen their cyber defenses. Um, and uh, and uh, we have also signed an agreement with them recently uh, on how NATO can provide a more technical uh, help. Uh, and then I also saw, for instance, today, the Chancellor informed me that uh, Germany is ready also to provide more experts uh, to, uh, to, uh, to uh, Ukraine to help them uh, strengthen their cyber defenses and, and protect their cyber networks. So uh, when it comes to cyber, NATO and NATO allies, support Ukraine and, and helping them to defend themselves against the cyber. So there's general support that has always been there and now additional support in this crisis situation? Well, Germany uh, announced, or the, the Foreign Minister Barbuk announced that they will, they're ready to provide uh, more uh, experts. I, I, I'm not able to, to, do, to, to tell you exactly what Germany is planning to do, but that has been announced. And that's one example of many allies that provide in different types of uh, support and some have also announced the willingness to step up in the light of the attack. But the attack that we saw a few days ago is not the first attack. So this is a, mm -hmm. a kind of consistent threat and many attacks over a long period of time. So we have been aware of the risk for cyber attacks for a long time. And that's exactly why NATO and the alliance, but also individual allies have already started to provide significant support to Ukraine on the issue of cyber defense. Okay. Well, I think we have first questions coming in from- We have a Davis. flurry of <coughs> questions coming in, Britta. And um, here's one, um, I, I, I'll pass over to you, Mr. Secretary General. It comes from Diana Fix, who's currently at the, at the GMF in, in, in Washington, DC. And her question is, NATO declared in its um, 2008 Bucharest declaration that Ukraine and Georgia will become a member of NATO one day, whenever that may be. Has this become a strategic impasse for NATO? So I was at that summit as Norwegian Prime Minister back in 2008, and uh, I remember very well, and, and again, it's no secret that there were different uh, views, but, and then we agreed uh, on uh, that decision, uh, meaning that we declared that these countries will become uh, members of NATO. We have uh, reiterated that uh, position many times since then, but we didn't uh, provide any timeline or we didn't grant what is called a membership action plan. Uh, 
we think that the important thing for uh, Ukraine is to focus on reforms, is to focus on meeting NATO standards. And, and of course, Ukraine have some serious challenges when it comes to, for instance, fighting corruption uh, and to meet all the NATO standards. Uh, and, and, and we help them with our capacity building programs, with, with, with the NATO office in Kiev, with experts NATO and NATO allies are sending to try to address these uh, challenges, uh, to fight corruption, to modernize the defense and security institutions. That is good in itself, because it makes Ukraine less vulnerable. It, it makes uh, Ukraine a better functioning society, a better governance, uh, more transparency. And uh, in addition, it, it moves Ukraine closer to, uh, to, mem to membership. And, uh, and that's exactly what we do. And I think that uh, we will continue to do that, focus on reform to meet NATO standards. Mm. I know, Mr. Secretary General, that you're not in the in the business of speculating, but still, here's here's an interesting military question. In fact, it comes from Philip L., a, a viewer of our live stream. And Philip asks, how long would it take NATO member states to mobilize a similar number of soldiers as Russia has already done, move them together on NATO's eastern border? So we are able to move a significant amount of forces uh, uh, quickly if needed. Uh, as I said, we have tripled the size of the NATO response force. And of course, individual allies also have the forces that they can uh, deploy quickly if, uh, if needed. Uh, that, no, but I mean, again, I will not go into operational details, but, but we, have, uh, we have forces, we, are, we have plans and, uh, and we are exercising. Uh, for different uh, uh, scenarios. Um, uh, but I think also you have to understand the following, is that as long as, we, as long as we have NATO and we have the commitment to protect and defend each other, of course, for instance, in Northern Norway, again, I'm from Norway, the, there, are not, there are not many forces, but NATO is, Norway is part of NATO. So we know that if, if, NATO was, if, if Norway was attacked, the whole of NATO would, would come to our support. The same in, in, the, in the Baltic region, we have a battle group uh, around 1,000 in each of the uh, uh, Baltic countries. Then, of course, you have the national uh, uh, home forces of the different individual countries, uh, Lithuania, Latvia, and so on. But, of course, compared to the tens of thousands of troops we have on the other side of the border, Russian, our forces are small. But the message is that since NATO is already there, since you have a multinational presence, any attack on any NATO ally will trigger a response from the whole alliance. And that's, that's deterrence. And the purpose of deterrence is not to provoke a conflict. It's actually not even to fight a war, but it's to prevent the war. Um, so uh, so uh, the reason I'm saying this is that this has worked for 72 years. For instance, Berlin, West Berlin was part of, uh, of, of NATO. When NATO never had forces in West Berlin that could, in a way, uh, stand up against the, the, the Red Army or, or the Warsaw Pact forces if they decided to invade West Berlin. But West Berlin was never invaded or, or, or attacked because they knew that the whole NATO, uh, including the United States, uh, were behind. So that's the message on the, of deterrence and that's the message of NATO. Hmm. So deterrence does work. In yeah, the, in absolutely. That's worked for 72 years and it will continue to work as long as we stand united. But add one more. It's one very important thing about that and that is that Deterrence works because we are so strong when we are together, meaning that we have to keep North America and Europe together. Uh, uh, because you see now that uh, the United States, but also Canada, uh, or, or United Kingdom being a European country, but not, not the EU member, of course, what they provide to our shared security of collective defense is of great importance. And we as Europeans also have to kind of <coughs> do our own, home, our own homework when it comes to our um, security capabilities, there are some people saying that the EU in this current crisis has kind of been missing in action. I think that's probably not entirely fair, but the European reaction to, to all of this is, is rather meager, I would say. So question to you as, as NATO Secretary General, how concerned are you that Europe is still not able to kind of I think the Chancellor, the former Chancellor Merkel, once said to kind of take its hand, its fate into its own hand. 
to, to provide for its own security. Is, is that a matter of concern for you? Well, first of all, I, I'm, I'm a strong supporter of the European Union. And I have, in my national capacity, I campaigned twice to, to convince Norwegian people to, 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 to vote yes and for Norway to join the European Union. I You're lost. No, no. <laughs> but I mean, I have really campaigned for, for the, the European Union because I really believe in the idea of, of the European Union. I think the European Union is extremely important for our economies, for the for the environment, for, for, for cooperation across Europe. So it's really a, a, a strong and important institution. Um, uh, and I also welcome the fact that over the last years we have been able to lift NATO EU cooperation to unprecedented levels. We consult closely with the European leadership. I, uh, and also on, on Ukraine, I met recently with uh, uh, President Ursula von Leyen. We discussed Ukraine. I actually went to the Baltic countries together with her um, a few weeks ago. And, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and I went straight from the NATO Russia Council uh, last week in Brussels uh, with NATO allies and Russia to the EU Defence Minister meeting in Brest where I briefed them and, and we consult on these issues. And of course, EU has an important role to play, uh, especially, for instance, when it comes to uh, imposing sanctions. So, so, so EU has a place to, uh, uh, role to play. At the same time, I think we have to understand that Europe is at the table when NATO is there. When we had the meeting of the NATO Russia Council, we were 30 allies out of which 28 are European allies, mm. representing 600 million Europeans. So, of course, Europe is at the table uh, because U NATO is Europe and North America together. That's what makes uh, so NATO uh, so unique, is that we bring Europe and North America together. And actually, these are, we, we have, we do, in reality, we don't have a European security, security architecture. We have a transatlantic security architecture. That's the, that's the purpose of NATO, is to bring that together. Two world wars, wars learned us or taught us the, the importance of having Europe and North America together. So, 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 so we need transatlantic security, and then, of course, European security is part of that. Um, uh, then I would also like to add that I welcome European efforts on defense. Uh, on, on providing new capabilities, on strengthening the European defence industry, on the European defence from PESCO, all that is great, strongly supported. And of course, any meaningful European effort on defence defense start with more spending. And there's one institution that has been calling on more European defence spending, and that's NATO. Uh, so that's great. What I don't think is uh, needed is more structures. We need more European defence capabilities, readiness, uh, planes, uh, ships, uh, all these things, uh, more competitive defense industry. But, but, but Europe has a readiness force. That's the NATO response force. And every time Europe has called for us to help them in Bosnia and Herzegovina, in Kosovo, or actually the Libya operation, that, the, the Libya operation was originally a European initiative. NATO was not at the table, that decision was taken. Then after some time, the Europeans came to NATO not for help, and then we helped them. So, Every time Europe goes to NATO and asks for help, uh, then we are there. We work together with them in Kosovo. Uh, we have uh, NATO troops in Kosovo supporting the efforts of European diplomats. So we have a response force, an intervention force, the NATO response force. Uh, and, uh, and Europe is part of that. Yeah. Europe, Europe is part of that, Mr. Secretary General. And is Europe also part of the discussion when it comes to resolving the Ukraine crisis? Um, <coughs> There's, of course, the issue of reviving the Normandy format. Um, what we do hear from, from Foreign Minister Baerbock's visit to Moscow and her talks with her Russian counterpart, Sergei Lavrov, is that, you know, very cautiously, there may be some positive um, noises when it comes to a, a revival of this format, or at least, you know, a sense that, that there is not a clear no-no to this. But also, How do you see that? Of course, all, also, of course Europe is part of, uh, part of the consultations on Ukraine uh, and uh, how to deal with that. Because, as I said, 28 out of NATO 30 members, 28 are European, representing 600 million European, uh, Euro Europeans. There are more Europeans in NATO than in the European Union. Mm. So, 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 so Europe is at the table. Uh, that's not the question. Mm. Uh, but then, of course, I welcome the efforts of the, uh, the European Union. But of course, we have allies who are not members of the European Union. Right. We have the United Kingdom. Uh, and I, and also, again, I, I am in favor of the European Union, and I'd like my own country to be part of it, but not all, all European countries are part, not the United Kingdom. 
uh, not Turkey, uh, not Norway, not Iceland, uh, and some of the Baltic countries are members of NATO, but not, not, not the European Union. So that's the reason why we have 600 million Europeans living in NATO countries. Um, and they are, they are, they also, that's Europe. Um, uh, but then, then the European Union has an important role to play as an institution. Uh, but sometimes we are mixing the European Union and Europe as that is one thing. No, that's two different things. Um, uh, and I think that the European Union and, and especially, for instance, European countries like France and, and Germany, they have a, a very important role to play, for instance, in the Normandy format. Uh, that's good. Then we have two European countries engaging, very important, support that strongly. But of course, sometimes we need all Europeans at the table. And then, of course, the big tent uh, is either the OSCE or, or, or NATO that bring many European countries to the table. We asked you to look into Putin's head. I would like to ask you to look um, into Lavrov's head because we watched the press conference, Annalena Baerbock and Lavrov gave today. And as the symbols and the tonality of statements are so important these days, I had the impression that at least there was no more escalation, perhaps too early to say that this is, was a kind of first step towards de-escalation. I don't know if you could follow that, but what is your impression um, these days? Where, where is Moscow? Where is Lavrov? Is there more flexibility uh, than perhaps last week to, for example, participate or to accept your invitation for further talks? As I was not able to watch that uh, press conference, uh, I've attended many different meetings in Berlin uh, today. Uh, uh, but I really hope that the meeting uh, that uh, the, for the, the, the Foreign Secretary, the Foreign Minister of Germany, uh, uh, Barbuk, had with the, the Russian uh, Foreign Minister, Lavrov, uh, had some kind of positive uh, outcome and, and it helped to, to move towards a, a real political uh, dialogue. Uh, I, think, I think it's just too early. Uh, uh, we, I think now uh, the United States and NATO has made it clear that we are ready to meet again. We are invited for more meetings and we will convey our proposals. Then I think uh, we need to see what Russia uh, says uh, and that will be in kind of a pivotal moment. So what are we looking forward to? Will there be a period of like two weeks of more talks and negotiations? I know that you can't say and precede the future, but... It, 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 we, will, we will submit our proposals in the near future. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, then, and, then, and then hopefully we can start meetings uh, soon after that. That will be up to Russia to decide. Mm -hmm. Because we, of course, to have dialogue, we need Russia at the table uh, to have any meaningful dialogue on the situation in the round Ukraine. But on the other side, there's a certain kind of time pressure, as I... Yes, I, I, we have seen what Russia ha, has been saying, uh, and uh, and uh, and of course, I think it's the, the easiest thing to do now, uh, and the quickest uh, thing would would be for Russia to de-escalate, mm -hmm. uh, to 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 remove the forces and to stop the threatening rhetoric, and then and then we can sit down, and and have you know important discussions about some uh, serious long-term concerns. So, for instance, arms control. I'm, I grew up with uh, uh, the SS-20 uh, um, and the Pershing and the cruise missiles mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and we demonstrated against those missiles and then we were all, all were so relieved when, when we had the, had the INF Treaty in 87. And, uh, and now we have seen the demise of that treaty. So anything that can re-establish um, verifiable balanced arms control on missiles in Europe is very much welcomed by, by NATO. But of course, to agree those technical things, verification mechanism, that takes some time. Uh, so the best thing would be if Russia should just de-escalate, remove troops, uh, and then we can engage uh, bilaterally in, in NATO, Russia, in serious talks about many things, including arms control. So today we are Tuesday. Would you say that the following days are significant to, to see where Moscow is heading to? Or? I think that first we should now submit our proposals to Russia uh, and then uh, we have to see the Russian reaction on that. Uh, that will be extremely important for whether we really can have serious discussions. They have asked us to uh, submit written proposals. We have told them that we are ready to do so. We will do that. We are working on that in NATO now. 
and as soon as they ready, they will be sent to, to Moscow, and then, and then we have to wait and see the Russian response. Okay, so we have to keep patient. Yeah, and I think it's a good thing to be a bit patient when you speak about peace. Uh, so, so, so I think we should spend the time uh, that is needed. Uh, and we are ready to sit down in the, also in the near future uh, and to uh, start a dialogue. And I also as a, issued an invitation today. Okay. Secretary General, thank you very much for having taken the time in, in the middle of a crisis situation. Thank you, Nora. And uh, thank you for watching us and sending your questions. Um, we do all hope that the, the situation will not escalate anymore, but perhaps de-escalate. Have a nice evening. Goodbye.